My name is Nate Kazmarek. I am Vice President and Director of the Regulatory Transparency Project for the Federal Society. Uh, this is our third virtual panel for the new film, They Say It Can't Be Done. And in my view, our panels uh, continue to get better and better with each one. This evening, RTP and Just Add Firewater are looking forward to a great dialogue on the future of our Earth. We have a very insightful group gathered, and we're honored that EPA Administrator Andrew Wheeler is here to kick things off. We're also very fortunate to have a fantastic moderator in Susan Dudley. Susan is the director of the George Washington University Regulatory Study Center. She is also a distinguished professor of practice in the Trachtenberg School of Public Policy and Public Administration. She previously served as administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs at OMB. Susan holds a master's degree from the Sloan School of Management at MIT and a bachelor's of science degree in resource economics from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. We're lucky to have her leadership at RTP and also grateful for her appearance in the film. I would note that Susan's CV is much larger and, and more accomplished than what I've stated, uh, but you can find her full bio and the complete bio of all of our speakers tonight on our website. The website is regproject.org, that's R-E-G project.org. If you're in the audience and you have questions for the panel, please send them along via the chat and we will ask them to, uh, we will ask those questions towards the end of the program. With that, uh, thank you all very much for being here. I'll turn it over to Susan. I was muted there. Um, thank you, Nate. Um, and I, I agree we have an accomplished panel for this evening's conversation. And I look forward to a lively discussion of the film and other topics that may come up. Um, now, because Administrator Wheeler has to leave us by 7.30, I'm gonna hold off introducing our other speakers until after we've heard from him. Um, and I will also try to be brief in my um, introductions, um, but I'll get right to that now. Andrew Wheeler is the 15th administrator of the Environment, Environmental Protection Agency. He's had a long career focused on environmental policy, starting in the George H.W. Bush administration, then serving on Capitol Hill as staff director for the Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works in both the majority and the minority, as well as in the Subcommittee on Clean Air, Climate Change, Wetlands and Nuclear Safety. He's also held leadership positions in the private sector at Fager Baker Daniels Law and Consulting Practices. With that, Administrator Wheeler, the floor is yours. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. And thank you, Nate, for inviting me um, this evening to participate in this. It's an exciting film. Um, in in the, the film, in its premise of wanting to encourage innovation by the private sector, innovation by new market market entrants. Um, you know, it's in sitting as a, as a head of, of a regulatory agency, you know, it's we're very mindful here. I'm very mindful of the, um, the impediments that regulatory agencies put into the marketplace that actually stop innovation by new market entrants. And the, the fact that we need to make sure that we are encouraging innovation, that we are encouraging a level playing field among everyone and trying to come up with the, the latest great invention. And we've done that in a number of ways. We're doing, we're doing that this year in the COVID response on um, approving disinfectants. You know, EPA improves the disinfectants. Think of um, chlorine wipes that you use on surfaces or think of aerosol sprays. And there's been a lot of applicants this year that have come to us with new products. And it's important that we don't just look at the products that come to us from the large multinational chemical companies, but we're also looking at products from startups, from mom and pop companies, from small businesses. And in order to encourage that, we have to make sure that the tools that we have at EPA are available for everyone. So one of the things we've done during this administration is take a look, a hard look, at how we are structured internally to make sure that the information that we use for our programs is readily available to the public. And we've had five pillars of, of reform here at EPA to try to open up, shed some sh sunlight into the regulatory process so everybody understands what we do as a regulatory agency. And those five pillars, um, the, the first is our cost benefit 
approach on our rulemakings. Um, we are going through a statute by statute basis to put out an, a cost benefit regulation that will require for every regulation that EPA does going forward that we identify the costs of the regulation and we identify the benefits of the regulation so that everybody knows the basis for our regulations. Our second pillar is on science transparency. And I started EPA, as Susan said, I started my career as a career employee here at EPA back in 1991, working on TSCA and Community Right to Know, the Community Right to Know Act. And I fundamentally believe that everyone has a right to know the basis of our EPA regulations. And so we have a science transparency regulation. We, we proposed it two years ago. We put out a, a, a second version asking for more comment and we will be finalizing it sometime this later this fall where we will require that the science that we use as the basis for our regulation to be made available to the public. In, in the event that there is a scientific study that is just very important and that information is not available, the administrator always has the right to waive that. But you know, it's, it's important for our regulations on both the cost benefit and the science transparency side that people know what the basis is for our regulations. And I, I found a lot of the people who oppo are opposed to that or people who would prefer to have our regulations written in the proverbial smoke-filled back room. Um, what I'm trying to do is shed light on how we make decisions at the agency. I'm trying to shed light on the information that we use so that I believe at the end of the day, our regulations will be better accepted by industry, will be better accepted by environmental organizations and better accepted by the American public. A along with this, um, we reorganize our regions we have 10 regional offices across the country and every regional office had different names for all their offices. For example, in one of our regions, they didn't even have an, a, a division that had clean air in the title. So if you went to our EPA website and you wanted information, if you were a startup business in California or a startup business in Ohio or Florida, you should be able to go to the EPA website and find out what, which office you needed to talk to. So we reorganized our EPA offices. All of our regional offices now mirror headquarters for the first time in our 50 year history. So it's much easier to navigate across the agency. If you're somebody who's not used to working with the EPA, you can get informa information much easier now because we have our regional offices mirroring our federal headquarters. The, the fourth, and I, and I announced this at the Federalist Society, um, I think two weeks ago, is our new guidance document. And this is really important, particularly for small businesses. Um, for years, our guidance documents, you had to go to EPA to our, our, to our docket rooms, our physical rooms here at EPA headquarters or in the regional offices and go through the file cabinets to find the applicable guidance documents that laid out the rationale or the directions or the guidance for our regulations or our, our rules and you had to know what you were looking for. What we did is we put all of them, all of our guidance documents on a searchable database. We discovered that we had 10,000 guidance documents. All 10,000 are now searchable on the database. This is a huge improvement over the, over the practices of years gone where you had to hire a DC law firm. To, and, I, and I actually, when I was in private practice, I had a, a multinational, um, it was a, 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 um, a you know, top 500 firm that hired us. They wanted to know information about a specific program at EPA and whether or not the agency had ever made any statements on it. They were being sued. They had, they had a product in, in market and they were being sued by a competitor. And the competitor was alleging that EPA um, would not have approved of the product. So they came to me as a lawyer. I brought them into the EPA. We went to the enforcement office. This was during the Obama administration and we met with two great career attorneys and they were very helpful. And they told us to their knowledge, they'd been at the agency for I think together 15 years and they knew of no document, no guidance. But they said, but if you really want to have the answer, you're going to have to hire somebody to go through all of our, docu all of our dockets to make sure that we didn't say anything about this 40 years ago. Can you imagine if you're a small business? I mean, this is a large multinational 500, um, you know, top 500 company. If you're a small business wanting to know what the agency has said about a particular subject, it's almost impossible. It's a real barrier to entry into the marketplace. So now all 10,000 of our guidance documents are available for search on our website. Um, the, the fifth area of, of our reform, of our five pillars, is on lean management. 
and this is where we've taken the um, the also called the Toyota system and implemented it across the agency and is improving the way that we process everything. We no longer have, um, we've reduced our backlog on permits over 55%. Um, state implementation plans in the Clean Air Act. It's, we had one, we found one dating back to 1975 that had never been acted on from a state that had just been sitting in the EPA um, Clean Air Office with no action. We had, we had, um, same implementation plans 20, 30, 40 years old. We're implementing lean management across the board is speeding up the way we process things. It's much more fair for everyone and eliminating the backlog. It's also helping the environment. I, I saw somebody was just scrolling through on the people who are, who are tuning into this. There's someone from Lakewood, Colorado. We have our large um, enforcement lab in Lakewood, Colorado, and they do the large multimedia enforcement inspections. We would do an inspection in a facility and it was taking on average 270 days to issue the inspection report to the facility to tell them what their issues and problems were. That meant 270 days without any changes. If our inspectors found a problem, nothing was happening at that facility to, to improve it for the environment. We implemented lean management at our Lakewood facility in Colorado. And again, they're the ones that do all of the national multimedia enforcement inspections across the country. Um, we're, we're now getting 90%, um, I believe it's 90% done within 30 to 45 days. So that is not only providing more certainty if you're a regulated business, but it's improving the environment because we're getting to those facilities and telling them what they're doing wrong so that they make the corrections and change. So these five pillars that, I, that I've discussed are, are ways that we are opening up the agency to sunlight, opening up our regulatory process, making things more fair so that if you don't have to be a large company to hire a fleet of attorneys to come into DC and, and search through our, our file cabinets, you don't have to be um, a, a large multinational company to figure out that the costs or the benefits behind the regulation and what the agency means. And you, you don't have to be on somebody who deals with EPA on a day in a day out basis to find if you have a clean air question and you live in California or you live in New York, you should be able to, to Go onto our website and figure out which office in the regional in the region where you live that you can ask your question to. So you know this is all about transparency. What we're trying to do here at the agency, and I believe it's leveling the playing field between large companies and small companies. One quick final point I like to make: um, there are a lot of a lot of opportunities that we are not taking, where large companies come in and want a regulation set that um, would make it more prohibitive for smaller companies to enter into the marketplace. And a perfect example is our recent methane um, regulations where we um, changed the Obama methane regulations. Um, we had large multinational companies come in and say, we, need, we want you to do a more strict methane emissions regulation. But the smaller companies are, so, are doing some of the most innovative um, emissions reduction techniques in the marketplace. And their, the regulations that the large companies would have were asking for would have put some of those smaller companies out of business or priced them out of business. And we've seen this time and time again over the history, the 50 year history of the EPA, where large companies have taken advantage of the regulatory state in order to drive up the regulatory cost to make it harder for small businesses to compete or small businesses to enter into the marketplace. So we're very cognizant of that. And there's several other um, examples I don't want to pick on any particular company, so I won't, but there's been several other examples since I've been here of large companies coming in and asking for a regulation, and then you look into it and you see, wait a minute, that's going to, that's going to cause a monopoly between a couple of large companies and nobody else is going to be able to compete, and that's not the American way. At the same time we're doing all this, just in close, we've reduced air pollution 7% under President Trump's um, administration. We've our water is cleaner than it's ever been. We've, we have invested over $40 billion in clean water infrastructure over the last four years. We're cleaning up Superfund sites at the fastest rate in 20 years. And on the enforcement side, there's a lot of people have attacked us from the environmental organizations to, to politicians on saying we're not enforcing the laws. We announced last week enforcement action against Daimler. Um, we have at this point um, enforce, collected more civil and criminal fines, double what the Obama-Biden administration did during their first four years. 
So our enforcement stats are twice as good as the Obama Biden enforcement stats were at this time during their administration. We are enforcing the law if anybody is breaking it. And that's another form of competition. If you have a company that's breaking the law, in addition to polluting the environment, they're getting a competitive advantage against their competitors. So we want to make sure that everyone is complying with the laws of the land, the environmental laws, and that um, and if they aren't, we will go after them. With that, Susan, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, Susan, I can't hear you. How about that? Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry about that. Your video yes. just went out for me. Maybe that's on my end. Um, thank you. That <laughs> that was great. And your discussion about um, innovators, the, the small innovators, that really does relate to the film that we um, that we're talking about today. Um, and in particular, the one um, I think there are several things that you said that I'd love to follow on in our discussion with the other panelists today. Um, the one that we're talking about today has to do with um, technologies to reduce climate change. And I wanted to ask you, there seems to be a mismatch mm -hmm. between EPA statutory authorities that are focused on conventional pollutants and environmental quality within U.S. borders and the challenge of climate change. So um, Mass v. EPA required EPA to address greenhouse gases using the Clean Air Act. So I wanted to ask you, how's that going? Um, given your experience, both at EPA and Capitol Hill, do you think Congress should try to develop a different approach? Um, and then I'll just throw in, because I'm the economist on this panel, would a mechanism like a carbon tax incentivize innovations like the carbon capture and sequestration that we saw in the film? Sure, well, first of all, I have to be very careful um, I can't endorse legislation without the approval of OMB or the, or the White House, so I don't. Um, but I will say that you know a, a carbon tax, a, a cap and trade, um, other programs um, would certainly be a different approach than what we are are dealing with the EPA because the Clean Air Act was not written or designed to address climate change. You know, I, you know quoting the late John Dingell, the Democratic congressman from Michigan who helped write the Clean Air Act and the 1990 amendments. Um, he said using the Clean Air Act to, to regulate climate change would be a glorious mess. Actually, I think he said to regulate CO2 would be a glorious mess, and it is. And the Obama Biden administration found that out when they put their clean power plan proposal out there and the Supreme Court issued their historic stay. You know, we're often accused of rolling back the clean power plan, but you can't roll back something that actually never took effect. Um, so when we got into office, we looked at what Mass versus EPA set, said. We looked at our authorities under the Clean Air Act, and we went forward with our ACE rule, which will reduce CO2 emissions um, from the electric power sector. And we've actually taken four concrete regulatory um, steps to reduce greenhouse gases. Our SAFE rule will reduce CO2 emissions going forward from automobiles. Our, the methane regulations will reduce um, greenhouse gases. And then the fourth one is we're reducing um, greenhouse gases from we proposed this summer. The first three were final. The fourth is a proposal this summer to reduce greenhouse gases from the from the aviation industry. First time that's ever been proposed. Um, is the Clean Air Act the best method or the best best um, statute to use for this? Um, no, it, it really isn't. Um, there are limitations, and again, the Obama administration found that out when when they tried and failed on their clean power plan. Um, but at the same time, it's important to note that our greenhouse gas emissions have dropped 12 percent since 2005. At um, the same time, most European countries have gone up. Since 2005, China has increased their greenhouse gas emissions 50 percent. There's a lot of innovation going on in the United States, and I think we need to encourage, continue to encourage that innovation. And, I, and the film highlights a lot of innovative, um, a lot of innovative techniques, and we need to do that. Um, on the electric power sector, we're going to have to solve the battery storage issue if we want to solve um, energy efficiency long term, and that isn't isn't there yet. But there are certainly other um, really promising scientific um, ingenuity innovations. Um, I'm really encouraged from what I see, and I think we need to make sure that we don't end up um, a mistake that some countries have made, and and it's a mistake that we occasionally make 
not just environmental regulations, but other regulations where we as a government decide what the technology should be. And we regulate to that technology instead of setting standards that allow for innovation in the marketplace. And I just want to always be mindful of that, that we should not stifle innovation in the marketplace. On the methane, a perfect example, we have doubled, methane is natural gas. We have doubled our natural gas production since 1990. At the same time, we've reduced our methane emissions 15%. That tells me that there's a lot of innovation going on in the marketplace to reduce those emissions because it makes sense for the companies involved. Methane is their product that they're selling. And we need to make sure whatever regulation we, we impose upon the American public does not stop innovation from occurring. Oh, I'm not muted now. Um, yes, and I think your point too about the, the technology, be, being careful not to focus on particular technologies, that was something that does come out in the film um, that that's a way that that can get in the way of innovation as opposed to finding ways to streamline permitting, not so much in the environmental vignettes in the film, but in the other ones, the issues were, we don't know who to go to, to get the permits or that there's no process for getting permits to do the things that we want. Could you talk to yes. us a little bit more about what you're doing? That was one of your pillars or, um, Actually, one of our goals for the second term on the permitting. Sure. And just one more one more point on the on the. Um, well, actually, no, let me go ahead and, and discuss the permitting. So we have reduced our permitting um, backlog, as I said, I think it's about 55 to 60 percent here at EPA. But it's important to remember that at this point in time, EPA is um, well, 96 to 97 percent of all water permits are done by the states. On the clean air side, um, 48 of the 50 states have the, um, de have the permitting programs delegated to them. So the majority of the environmental permits today are done by the states. So one of the things that we're going to do in the second term is focus on working with the states to speed up their permitting and to help them get them more resources, which is not necessarily money. It can be, tech it can be a technical assistance, et cetera, but we are going to, um, you know, as of now, when we delegate programs to the states, the only thing we look at, the only measured um, statistic we look at is the, on the enforcement side. So starting next year, in addition to looking at their enforcement statistics, we will also start looking at how they process permits and the permitting statistics as well. Um, so that will be something that we will be doing um, going forward. Oh, you're muted again. There. So am I muted now? You're on. You're on now. I can hear you. Somehow the my the toggling doesn't seem to be working. Sorry about that. Um, your discussion about the regional work and how the regions work with the states and community-based programs. Could you talk to us just a little bit more about that? Certainly, and that that is another priority for for um, for our second term. And this is something that I've been I've been thinking about uh, and watching communities struggle with for at least 25 years. Uh, back when I worked in the Senate back in 1997, we had a um, mayor, a minority mayor from Benton Harbor, Michigan, testify in front of the Senate committee. And she came in front of the committee and she said, the EPA Brownfields office is encouraging us because we have a lot of um, abandoned facilities across our inner city. They come, they, they've come to us and they've recommended that we apply for Brownfields grants in order to rehabilitate these old industrial facilities, turn them into productive use and, and you know, encourage new businesses to move in. And she said, the air office at EPA has come in and said, you are in non-attainment and you cannot increase your air emissions. What am I supposed to do? I have the Brownfields office saying you need to redevelop and I have the area office saying you can't bring any new businesses into your city. It's, it's, a, it's a paradox that we've put a lot of cities into across the country. We also have, a, a I believe, a perverse um, environmental outcome. It's unintentional outcome over the last 50 years of EPA where we have encouraged businesses instead of redeveloping in our inner cities, we have encouraged them to move out into green space and to, you know, former farmland and put new facilities in those areas. 
Um, instead, we should be encouraging them for the jobs, for the to clean up the, the sites in inner cities, um, and to reuse those facilities. So instead of um, instead of you know, diverting resources, we want to work with the cities to look at their environmental programs holistically. We want them to look at their air issues, their water issues, their waste issues all at one time. So we're going to promote a, a community environmentalism at the community level going forward. One of the ways we want to do that is to create, um, for example, a master um, grant application for cities where we take maybe a dozen different EPA small grants and package them together. But what I've told my staff, we can't take 10 grant applications, each one 10 pages long, and then give a mayor a 100 page grant application. We have to, um, as an agency, restructure the way we think and combine those programs and combine them into a, a smaller grant application. So it will help the cities think holistically about their environmental problems. And it will also help the EPA staff think holistically about the environmental problems. We are a very siloed agency. We have our air program, our water program, our waste program, and our chemicals program. And our offices historically have had a hard time talking across the silos. So what I'm, what I'm trying to do, what we're trying to do as a team going into the second term is to take a look at those silos, tear them down, work more together on a holistic approach to solve the environmental problems in the communities where the people live. If I have time for one more question, speaking of cities and where people live, um, there, there are serious concerns about worse environmental degradation in areas where uh, of people who are low income. Mm -hmm. What can we do about that? Well, you know, we, we have taken that head on. Um, under President Trump, we elevated environmental justice to the administrator's office. In the past, it was just in our enforcement program. And that um, puts it at the end of the process. You, you know, you can't really take into account environmental, um, environmental outcomes and in the way the environment um, impacts low-income communities if you only look at it after the pollution has already occurred. So we have elevated environmental justice in our administration for the first time to the administrator's office where we now look at it across the entire regulatory process, the very beginning when we're developing our policies, developing our regulations. You have to do that in order to take environmental justice seriously. I think that President Trump's um, Opportunity Zone tax credit program in the 2017 um, Trump tax pl um, plan was probably the biggest environmental boom to environmental justice communities than all the environmental justice grants over the years because that's focusing, um, it, it's focusing private sector money into these low income neighborhoods by zip code. There are inner city uh, um, opportunity zones, there are rural counties that qualify for opportunity zone. Um, tax preferential tax treatment that is helping these communities deal with their environmental issues and concerns and then um, the the water bill that, that President Trump signed into law two years ago was the first time that environmental justice has the, the concept of environmental justice office EPA has ever been recognized in law so we're, we're doing a lot there but we're also doing it and focusing on the Superfund side you know when I said earlier that you know we cleaned up 27 Superfund sites um, last year, the most in any one year since 2001. Um, we will have, by the end of this year, I believe it's 81 or 82 Superfund sites cleaned up during this first four years, um, which is equal to what the Obama Biden administration did in their first eight years, or their only eight years, I guess. Um, so we, we are really focusing on, in particular, Superfund cleanups and brownfields in um, low-income neighborhoods and minority communities. And that's what we need to do. But by putting environmental justice at the beginning of the process, instead of only looking at it at the end, I think it's going to be a big help um, going into the future. Well, thank you very much, Administrator Wheeler. Um, thank you. And I'm sure that there'll be a lively discussion after you leave us. So tune in to the recording later. <laughs> um, I'm sure I said nothing at all controversial, and I'm sure everybody will agree with everything that I've said. <laughs> I'm sure. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So um, let me now introduce our other fine panelists. Um, <clears throat> and I'll start with, I'll introduce all, all three of our panelists. 
first, and then we'll go in that same order um, with some opening remarks. So David Doniger is speaking to us today as Senior Advisor to the Natural Resources Defense Council Action Fund. David is a lawyer and climate expert who joined NRDC in 1978 and is now Senior Strategic Director of its Climate and Clean Energy Program. He served in the White House and the EPA during the Clinton administration. Um, next, we'll hear from Charles Hernick. He's the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions Forum in Washington, DC, where he leads policy work and executes strategies to advance clean energy solutions and innovative approaches to reducing carbon emissions. Charles is an energy and climate change expert who's worked at the crossroads of economic development, energy and natural resource management across the US and in over a dozen countries in Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean. And then James Coleman is an associate professor at Southern Methodist University's Dedman School of Law, where his scholarship focuses on energy law, including the regulation of North American energy companies, how countries account for and influence regulation of fuel and electricity and their trading partners, and how global energy companies respond to competing pressures from investors and regulators in multiple jurisdictions. So David, would you start us off with some opening remarks? Yes, thank you very much. It's uh, be here and talk uh, at a Federalist Society uh, session. Um, hopefully you, I can convey some perspectives that uh, you might not hear so often. Um, as I listened to Andy Wheeler, um, I heard in the first part of his talk uh, a focus on managerial steps, some of which uh, uh, are important. Others, quite frankly, are from our vantage point um, reflect an agenda of trying to impose barriers to public health and environmental protection. But what I didn't hear was uh, any focus on the core uh, threats to people's health and well being uh, that should guide um, the EPA's mission. And the number one thing that is missing from this administration's uh, environmental agenda is uh, a serious and honest approach to climate change. Um, climate change is the central uh, environmental challenge country and, and the whole world. Um, it might have been thought speculative and doubted. Uh, you, you might you might have been um, uh, you know. Uh, more um, uh, free or more credible in doubting this 10, 15, 20 years ago, 40 years ago. But the chickens are coming home to roost. We, we have another season of horrible wildfires in the West, another season of uh, record hurricane activity in the Atlantic and in the Gulf of Mexico. We have so many um, uh, signs, so many, so much evidence that not only is climate change a future threat, it's a present threat. And it is a threat to our health, to our economy, to our infrastructure, to our most vulnerable communities, and to all the other kinds of life that we're in. Uh, it's already, it, 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 it will have, but it's already having even more impact than something on the scale of the global COVID pandemic, only slower, but far more permanent in, in its pace and scale. The pollution that's driving climate change, once it goes in the air, it lasts for centuries. Carbon dioxide lasts well over a century. Methane is a little bit shorter, still several decades. Uh, we are 
way over the atmosphere is way overloaded already we're way deep in overtime to address this problem the last administration took significant first steps here at home and brought us into what i would call a virtuous global cycle the previous administrations had said to i won't won't and in the paris agreement uh, and in the diplomacy leading to it, we moved from that to, I will, if you will, a virtuous cycle. And uh, with all due respect to Administrator Wheeler, this administration's climate denial, its protection of the fossil fuel industry, its wreckage of our international relationships and leadership can never be forgiven. If this administration is only a one-term affair, we will be able to save EPA as an institution and save the Clean Air Act and the other laws that are the tools for action. And we'll be able to restore Congress's ability to function, at least I hope so. And if we take smart action, climate solutions can be part of a new era of public and private investment in clean energy in new American industries and jobs, and in repairing long festering racial, social, and economic inequities. But the time lost due to this administration's denial and rollbacks, we can never get that back. It's irremediable. And our children and our grandchildren will pay for that in the impacts that could have been averted. Now, I would just like to take a moment to respond to several of the things that Administrator Wheeler said about carbon, about climate regulation. Um, his uh, four uh, steps that he mentioned uh, are all rollbacks, are all intended to uh, disassemble first steps taken in the last administration or impose barriers to taking steps in the future. The um, Vehicle rule, the so-called safe rule, is actually an unsafe rule. It will lead to more, not less, uh, death from pollution and, and traffic accidents. Um, it rolls back the progress that was to be made. We were going to have uh, vehicle emissions cut in half from new cars, uh, the carbon emissions, so the greenhouse gas emissions, compared to where they were in 2012, uh, by 2025, uh, they basically are improvement, and there'll be nearly a billion tons more carbon pollution uh, introduced into the air from the vehicles built under these weaker standards. The power plant regulation that they that We, we are um, in place of the clean power plan is actually an attempt to lock in uh, a do nothing rule that, and maybe even to revive coal plants so that they run more and pollute uh, more rather than less as a result of the rule. If it makes any progress at all, it's on the order of a 1% change uh, by the end of this, this decade. The airplane regulation is actually a proposal to lock into EPA regulations less than what the airlines are already doing, uh, a less efficient um, uh, aircraft fleet than the airlines are doing. So at, at the, you know, you might say uh, it, it will be irrelevant because it's surpassed by what happens in the marketplace. Now I'm a believer that standards should be based it should be set as performance standards. You shouldn't be picking technologies. And we should be using economic instruments like um, uh, capped and tradable permits. Um, we are um, open to uh, reforming how regulation occurs, but we just cannot solve this problem by uh, appealing to uh, innovation uh, alone. We need innovation, but it, it, it needs to be, as, as someone said in the film, uh, standards and regulations create the conditions that drive innovation. 
by making it necessary and, and, and actually rewarding to solve a problem that nobody recognized was a problem. You know, the, the market, the cost, when you have standards that are smartly designed to, to um, internalize those costs, you get tons of innovation and cost reduction. And we should be designing the rules to produce that. Uh, but we need rules because otherwise there's no drivers, no rewards for that kind of innovation. And until uh, we get serious in recognizing the extremity of the climate change threat and start using the EPA's current powers and thinking about new legislation, until that we are failing our children and our grandchildren on a scale that um, uh, they will, they will, and they will hate us for it. So um, uh, those are my thoughts. And when time comes, happy to answer questions. Thank you, David. Um, Charles, let's hear from you now. Sure. Thank you, Susan. And thanks to Nate and the Federal Society for putting this event on. It was a pleasure for me to watch the movie and, and think about this. Um, I agree with the title of this conversation. It, it can be done. I, I don't disagree with uh, David at all in terms of the urgency of the climate change problem and the situation that we're in, but I don't believe that we've lost any time on the clock. And I know that focusing on the two pillars that the movie really focused on, innovation and regulation, the right kind of regulation, we can go far. Um, I think that uh, w one thing that is clear is, and, and the administrator mentioned this, is that uh, the, the law constrains the executive branch right now in terms of what can be done uh, to regulate CO2. Um, and so that's not to say that nothing has happened in the United States, though. I think in a very federalist and, and appropriate way, states have stepped up. We've seen great state leadership uh, and different policy courses overtaken over the last uh, four years and more and more states committing to net zero, more and more companies committing to net zero, focused on what they can do, companies, uh, tech companies like uh, Microsoft and Amazon, but oil companies as well, Shell, BP, Total, just to name a couple of the companies that have dedicated to reduce emissions as quickly as possible and achieve net zero by mid-century, which is consistent with what the science tells us that we need to do. These are good independent actions. It's not only up to the federal government to solve the climate problem. We as individuals and as consumers can do a lot. And I think that what you're seeing is a response to unprecedented demand from individuals and other companies to reduce emissions. I wanna provide a little background and context and, and I'll keep my remarks relatively short so that we can get to the, the meat of the conversation here. But my background is informed by over a decade of work working uh, as a consultant to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in states and really understanding what that federal state policy nexus is, but also working for over six years in countries in Africa and Latin America and scrolling through the, the list of where people are attending from. It's not just folks from the United States, but from the developing world too. One of the major challenges that we have in the United States to tackle the climate change problem is 100 years of built infrastructure. Every morning, I wake up, I go to the bathroom to brush my teeth, and I turn on the light, and it comes on. And that doesn't happen everywhere in the world. And that's something that is fantastic, but also creates a lot of drag and inertia in terms of our ability to change and upgrade and move to that clean energy future that we know that we want to head to. To overcome those burdens, of what is our historical infrastructure legacy, we need a keen focus on regulation to be able to permit new technologies the way the administrator was talk about, talking about in a, in a speedy way. The administration has put a good focus on modernizing NEPA and providing businesses a single point of contact when they're dealing with the US federal government. Um, it's not an easy process, and when you look at something like hydropower relicensing, that's something that can take almost a decade. And if we're really serious about tackling climate change, we need to be able to deploy all of the above technology resources as quickly as possible. And so to do that, we do need to look at what are the appropriate 
regulations, what's the appropriate amount of red tape to assure that safeguards for people in public health are being met. I agree with David in that standpoint, but we also need to be able to actually implement the projects that will deliver those that clean energy and those environmental benefits um, as quickly as possible. On the innovation standpoint, we have a lot of technologies at our fingerprint, at our fingertips to be able to make this transition. But in every corporate plan, um, how to get there in years 2040 and 2050, it's still to be determined. And we know that there's more technology that we're going to need. That focus on innovation is absolutely critical, not just for tackling climate change, but for creating the jobs that we know that we need to have come with it. Two thirds of all new jobs come from small businesses. And right now, when we're looking at an era where a lot of folks have unfortunately been uh, either put to working from home or have had their paychecks decreased or lost their jobs entirely, we need to look at how we can create robust economic growth and tackle climate change at the same time. So assuring that all technologies can compete and that we're focusing on innovation uh, and what are the appropriate roles for government, what are the appropriate roles for the corporate sector in fostering that innovation and deploying those technologies is something that we need to work on. We're developing new, new nuclear technologies and small modular reactors here in the United States, but we can't deploy them. We have to look to other countries to be able to do that just because regulations haven't been modernized. There are new types of hydropower that have smaller environmental impacts than ever before in the history of hydropower, and that's the oldest way of generating electricity. There are 88,000 dams in the United States, and only 3% of them generate electricity. A lot of those dams need to be taken down to restore environmental benefits and salmon corridors and, and you know, restore environmental benefits that are needed in local areas. But if we can add and electrify even a percentage of those 88,000 dams, we're talking about a lot of clean electricity. And that's something that we do need to be able to focus on. But if those types of projects are caught up in seven plus years of regulatory red tape, it's not gonna happen. And it's not gonna happen on a fast enough timeline to safeguard my young daughters who I hope can grow up in an environment that is clean um, and readily available. The good news is that for a lot of the world, there's still folks that need those first kilowatt hours of electricity. For, for my friends that tuned in from Brazil and, and other parts of, of the world, um, there's a lot of need and there's an open field where new technologies can be deployed and a lot of folks will be able to leapfrog the types of old legacy technologies that we're stuck with here in the United States. And that's a good thing. So looking at that innovation is beneficial, not just here in the United States, but it means that if we can innovate here at home, those we can export to other countries and there will be an American flag put on the clean energy that is developed across Africa, Latin America, and parts of Asia. So I'll leave it at that and I'll look forward to this conversation. Thank you, Charles. All right, James. Thank you so much, and it's just wonderful to be here. Thank you so much to all of the panelists. Uh, this is an amazing amount of expertise on one, one panel. So, so I'm gonna start by building on something that I think all of our panelists have said, which is that this is an incredibly urgent task. There is an urgent need for cleaner energy sources because we need to both lower our greenhouse gas emissions here in the United States and also to, low, to lower them globally to address the climate challenge. But I think I would also say- uh, I'm, James, uh, I'm hearing so, a real echo. Yeah. I, James, you might have a second window open on one of your screens there. I think we're getting a little bit I of an just, echo. I just have the one right there. I just have the one right there. But, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry for that. Maybe one of the tricks would be the window on your screen. Is that any better? Is that any better? Okay, apologies, multiple screen setup. Good, okay, so I'm gonna keep going. So the uh, so in fact, I just wanted to deepen that challenge, which is it's not just climate, 
right? Because in fact, we also, uh, you know, if you look at our ur most urgent challenge environmentally is clean air, right? If you, if you look at some of the rules that were proposed during the Obama administration, you know, if you looked at them on a cost benefit basis, often even here in the United States, the biggest benefits they produced was as a side matter by cleaning up our air. And in most of the world, clean air is an even uh, bigger concern than it here is here in the United States. And then there's a third challenge, which is increased energy access. Uh, because there, you know, there are billions of people in the world who do not use as much energy as all of us use just for our refrigerator in our house. And so we need to massively expand access to energy across the globe. But if you look at the people that do have energy, you know, most of that comes from uh, the biggest source in the world is coal power. So, you know, if they don't always have access to the same clean energy technologies that we have here in the United States. And so it's a huge challenge. I think the other thing I would say about, um, so I, I totally agree with the urgency of the task, but also the importance of focusing on technology. Because for those of you who spend any time, you know, on energy issues, what you'll know is there are so many possible solutions that people look at. They look at, you know, they they look at, we heard talks of dams. We, you know, you have existing solar wind batteries as the administrator discussed. You could go to, you know, more advanced forms of solar power. I, you know, a lot of people are excited about forms of nuclear power, geothermal. There are a lot of different available options. And each of those options comes with different challenges when we're looking at the impact on uh, air quality, when we're looking at the impact on our need for resources and mining, when we're looking at our, the impact on climate. And so uh, I think it is very important, as all of us has emphasized, that you know, we, don't, we don't yet know the energy system has produced so many surprises over the last over the last decades. We're not sure which of these mix of technologies is going to get us where we need to go. But you know, as David said, that doesn't mean we can stand still, right? We can't just wait until, oh, we've got the, we've got the technology figured out. We need to have regulations that don't lock us in to bad choices, but do encourage good choices. And you know, as uh, Susan said, you know, one option potentially is a carbon tax. If you look on the capture, um, one solution that you see in the video is carbon capture, right? And that is something that we are incentivizing through certain policies, you know, basically through these 45Q tax credits that are designed to encourage at 35 or $50 a ton, uh, carbon uh, capture and sequestration. And so there are efforts to do that, but we obviously need to have a more systematic uh, way of encouraging all of these. And so the last thing I would just say is that, you know, in keeping with our the name of our movie, uh, it can be done. So there are these huge challenges in front of us, but if you look at what US greenhouse gas emissions were projected to be in 2004 or 2005, we have made drastic progress, dramatic progress in cutting those emissions. And it's fair to say we should have cut much more. But if you look at the change in what was projected then and what we've done now, you see the impact of some of the technologies, our improved deployment of wind and solar, our uh, increased production of natural gas. So we have had a lot of things that have caused us to have lower emissions. And so we've already made great progress on these. We know it's possible to produce economic growth and energy, reliable energy access while addressing these problems. But it, but it is an urgent problem that we need to be pushing through all the different uh, technology options. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, I, I think I heard a lot of agreement um, that Yes, this is something, climate change is something that we do need to address, um, the urgency of the problem. Um, I, I'm curious whether people think the Clean Air Act is a tool that can help us do that. Um, and that there are going to be a lot of different ways, different technologies that we need to be able to use to, um, to address this problem. Um, I'm going to bring us back to the film, if I can. Um, 
I was struck by the difference between the four innovator scenarios. For three of them, the, the entrepreneur's frustration seemed to be getting permission from regulators to test and bring their innovations to market. But for the CO2 capturing machines, the entrepreneur seemed to be asking for new regulation that required cap carbon capture and sequestration. So I'm curious what you all thought about that. Because when I hear someone calling for regulation that requires other companies to use their technology, it raises a red flag. Um, that was something Administrator Wheeler said that they're alert to, that when big businesses come in and say, regulate in a certain way, that raises a red flag that maybe it's to give them a competitive edge. Um, and that's something that we know about regulation, that often it does get hijacked to provide well-connected interest, competitive advantage, undermining the, the purported goal. Um, but the entrepreneur in that vignette, I think he does raise important points. Um, for those who haven't seen it, he's um, um, creating artificial trees, windmill machines um, that, that, that do try to, that can capture and then sequester carbon. Um, what policies can we find that incentivize solutions like that? Um, so I'll just pop in the carbon tax again. I hear from, I've heard from some of you all of the above. Um, David, you did talk about a carbon tax where you pay a tax when the carbon is taken from the ground and then you get a rebate when it gets put back into the ground. So I'm, I'd love to just open it up to everyone. And I see David is already eager to, to jump in. Yeah, well, I, I guess a point I should have made in, is just how, just how dire the, the emissions overload is. We used to think about, you know, we have an emissions budget left to spend. Yeah, it, there, are, there are pathways to get to net zero by 20, 50 or earlier if you can, but we really ought to think about that as everything we do from now until then is adding to a problem which is already serious and making it worse. So that puts a big premium on figuring out not just how to stop putting carbon dioxide into the air, but how to remove it from the atmosphere. So these technologies that are being explored in the film are very interesting and should be encouraged uh, and can be encouraged by um, uh, regulatory structures, a variety of them. Tax would be one approach, although there are a lot of issues with how uh, you could get a, a tax, effective tax implemented, frankly. Uh, a cap and trading approach uh, is um, another approach. Some sort of responsibility, uh, uh, corporate responsibility approach, namely you, you need to need to be responsible for removing what you put in the air, sort of cradle to grave approach. There are various ways to do that and they can be structured in ways that are technology neutral and innovation friendly. But mainly you need a, a constraint, uh, an economic one or a, or a quantity one, which is going to motivate people to invest in and, and pay for the use of technologies like that. And um, uh, you know, NRDC is in favor of exploring those technologies, especially if they take if the CO2 is permanently sequestered. Uh, we're less comfortable with using it as a uh, incentive for more um, oil production, but that's a, a different matter. If I could just um, uh, say one thing more uh, in response to uh, Susan's concern about. Um, and Andy's concern about big companies, small companies. My view of the methane situation is quite different from what An Andy Wheeler portrayed. What you have is a bunch of small companies, all of which are really, they're decent sized companies. They may be in trouble uh, moment, uh, at the moment because of the decline or prices, but but they are, these companies are millionaires and billionaires. Uh, and they have just, whether it's on um, libertarian principle or uh, uh, 
self-interest or cussedness, they have re resisted doing really simple things to zip up the uh, leakage of methane from their operations. And you have the majors who are willing to do that and uh, in many cases have been doing it. Many of the smaller companies have been doing it too, but there are a number of them which have been uh, pushing for this rollback ever since the, uh, the Trump uh, uh, administration began. And it has the flimsiest of justifications uh, and it will be struck down in the courts. Um, and I am very confident of that. Um, uh, so, yes, there is a possibility, and, and it happens, that uh, companies use the regulatory process to try to gain uh, specific advantage. But if we're smart about how we design the, these performance standards, we should be able to prevent that and still um, uh, address these problems, create the signals that drive innovation in the marketplace, which can only come by limiting or pricing these things that the marketplace is currently ignoring. I, I uh, want to jump in and, and uh, disagree with, with David a, a little bit, because I think that if we're in a hurry to solve the climate problem, we can't wait for the political uh, miracle to occur where legislation is passed to establish mandates and regulations and cross our fingers that what comes out the other end is going to be useful for solving the climate problem in a meaningful and quick way that actually is beneficial to all Americans. The, the best quote that I loved in the movie was that voters aren't very organized. Lobbyists are very organized. And I think that if we rely on a regulatory approach, we're going to end up with a solution that favors a lot of the existing actors which are interested in moving as slowly as possible and maintaining the longest economic life of their existing assets. And we're not gonna solve the problem as quickly as we can. The best way I think to do this is a non-regulatory approach that favors improving information for consumers, small, large investors, um, and allowing supply to match demand. And the reason for that is we can talk about a carbon tax, we can talk about cap and trade, we can talk about a clean energy standard, these are all ways from economic perspective, and Susan, you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, to internalize an externality. But the problem and what's changed is that climate change isn't an externality anymore. Everybody knows about climate change. Um, any Twitter feed that you follow and, and you know, Republicans and conservatives and Democrats and liberals all agree that climate change is real and we need to do something about it. Where the disagreement occurs is what and how. And that's where if we can provide consumers with, info, with the right information, then they can empower themselves to take the action and choose product A or choose product B and reduce emissions. Imagine a world where you're driving down the street. And now that we're driving more and more again, this is uh, actually, actually realistic. But if you're going to choose the gas station at the left or gas station at the right, right now we're shopping on price point. But imagine a scenario where these carbon capture utilization and storage technologies have been deployed as oil and gas companies want to. And gas station on the left is your traditional gas. Gas station on the right is selling net zero gasoline, where carbon was sequestered on the front end. And what comes out, it's still gasoline. It's still going to emit CO2. But that carbon has been otherwise sequestered further up in the system. This is a way that we could empower consumers and deliver these solutions to the marketplace a lot faster without extra regulations mandating carbon capture, but by empowering consumers this is a way that we could help solve the problem in a much quicker way. James, do you have any thoughts on that? Let me say something in a comment because uh, you know I think I'd probably come down more on the on the regulatory side. Although I would say that the correct amount of carbon emissions isn't zero either. So I'd be more on the tax. You know, make make companies pay for the externality. But I would say that one thing that we, I think we have in common is the need for building new infrastructure. Uh, whatever, whatever you believe in, we need more clean energy infrastructure. And I think, you know, if you look at the plans of the current administration or a potential Biden administration, one big goal is building a lot of new 
uh, energy infrastructure. And I think currently we have, uh, you know, our permitting system, and it's not just NEPA, it's a bunch of things, but it has slowed those things down. And so there needs to be work on permitting reform to make that faster. I'm seeing some really interesting questions in the chat box, and maybe I'll just bring out one of them that I saw um, flashing by. And that was, um, what about, I mean, we energy poverty, we do care about environmental justice. And at, to what extent do the costs of increasing? So um, now, Charles, you talked about the gas station that uses the, the capture and sequestration. But that gas is going to be more expensive and people are still going to be making decisions based on their pocketbooks. So how is it that we do internalize those rather than just provide the information? And second, what do we do about um, the problem that this is going to increase energy costs and increasing energy costs are going to hit the, the lowest income people, obviously the hardest. That's absolutely true for the oil and gasoline example. If we were to sequester right now, the costs are higher. Um, but, you know, James mentioned the 45Q tax credit, that's helping uh, and will help reduce the cost of carbon capture and storage. The more it's deployed, and this is the story with any innovative technology, the more it's deployed, the more the costs come down. And as we're able to manufacture more of this technology in the United States, eventually it will be cost competitive and cheaper. And that story is true when you look at solar power and wind power. Right now, it is cheaper in every part of the United States to build new solar and build wind than it is to build any other type of fossil fuel generation with the exception of natural gas in some cases. So we have, we've reached that point where even without subsidies, solar and wind are competitive. Um, and so we, can look at the energy poverty equation. And I think that that's absolutely true when you look at uh, liquid fuels in the automotive sector, there might be that trade off right now. But when you're talking about solving the energy poverty question in the United States, as it relates to electric power or even around the world, we're at this point where solar and wind are really the best bet um, and where there are other renewable resources that can be brought online in a cost competitive way. Hydropower, for example, but if you have to pay attorneys on an hourly basis for seven years, it gets to be a very expensive hydropower project just on attorney fees. So if we can look at fast tracking um, some of these permit approval processes, um, still being uh, still creating environmental benefits uh, to the waterway, but also from a clean energy generation standpoint, then we'll be moving quickly. Yeah, I had two points. I one some of the worst forms of regulatory capture that are being exhibited right now are by the owners of legacy coal plants and nuclear plants. They're trying to get public subsidies to keep them open. Um, and the worst example of that is HB6 in Ohio, which passed and we now discovered um, uh, it was the passage of that bill was lubricated by $60 million in outright bribery. So, um, uh, environmentalists and libertarians can agree that there are uh, many places where the regulatory system is um, screwed up in, in this way. Um, uh, one other thing that I, I neglected to mention earlier is that one of the, the uh, steps that Andy Wheeler and the Trump administration have taken that is most destructive in the climate area is refocusing what they call the social cost of carbon. Uh, the, um, in any effort to balance benefits and costs uh, and to figure out really what the, where, where you would wanna put the limits or how you would wanna price the pollution, you'd have to have some decent idea of what the benefits of, the, of curbing the pollution are. Now, back in the Bush administration, the second Bush administration, the, um, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration published a fuel economy rule. And in that rule, they said, the benefits of curbing carbon dioxide pollution are uncertain. So we will assign them zero, a value of zero in the cost benefit analysis. And the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals said, that's the one answer that has to be wrong. 
uh, you know, if you're acknowledging that there's damage, but you put zero into the equation, that's the one answer that's clearly wrong. So the Obama administration attempted to develop a, a principled, articulated, transparent methodology for determining what benefit number you should associate with the reduction of one ton of carbon dioxide. Uh, and one of the principles of that is, well, this stuff spreads all around the world. We should take into account not just the damage that occurs in our own borders, but the damage that's imposed on other countries. And there's a, a reciprocity principle there. You want China to do that. You want uh, the European Union to do that, to take into account the damage they're doing to us, not just the damage they're doing to themselves. This administration has scrapped that and substituted an analysis which confines itself to the damage that our pollution does solely within our borders. And I don't think they estimate that very well. But even so, it ignores the bulk of the damage that's done outside our borders. And if everybody did that, it would be the equivalent of uh, my neighbor throwing his trash into my garden and me throwing my trash into his garden and we would both wonder why our gardens are full of trash. So this is one of the uh, most damaging uh, and least uh, honest uh, um, analytical changes that this administration has, has imposed in the climate area. And they've been struck, uh, they've, they've, they've lost on this point a couple of times already in court and they're headed for uh, more, more um, defeats uh, on the implementation of this uh, cramped methodology. But David, this, I'll ask you a question I asked of the administrator. Um, doesn't that argue that the Clean Air Act just isn't the right tool because the Clean Air Act does talk about air quality in the United States? How can that be the, a tool to look at air quality in other countries? Well, actually the Clean Air Act has provisions in it that directly address when, we, when our pollution is causing harm in other countries. It does not limit itself to the damage or the welfare impacts that are, occur in our country. So that, that's simply not a limitation. Look, I wouldn't, you know, if we were starting from scratch, I wouldn't say that um, uh, the Clean Air Act is, is uh, absolutely ideal, exactly as it's uh, written. But, you know, in 1965, President Johnson asked Congress to pass new clean air legislation that included tackling climate change in 1965. And in 1970, Congress did that. And the authority has been there. The courts have recognized that it's there. Uh, you can do uh, very effective things under the Clean Air Act. You can't do everything that's needed. And there are good arguments that there might be ways to do things more efficiently. But, um, to paraphrase Donald Rumsfeld, you fight climate change with the laws you have, um, and not the laws you wish you had. Uh, and that has been the guiding uh, uh, principle to do what we can under this law, which was built to be adapted for new pollution problems, not just the things that were uh, right in front of the first EPA administrator. Yep. It'll be a frustrating next 30 years if we're still waiting to figure out how to use the Clean Air Act to regulate uh, CO2 and, and get that done. And, and that's why I'm, I'm a bigger fan of doubling down on the existing federal and state roles. Um, what David's been talking about is, um, you know, mechanisms for, for increasing uh, costs of CO2 emissions, using federal powers uh, to do that. Um, I'm not interested in figuring out how do we can raise costs that's going to exacerbate the energy poverty problem, uh, Susan, that, that you mentioned. The historical and best federal role has been to help signal the market, send a strong signal to the market through tax incentives. And it's worked. It's taken nascent technologies from solar and wind to, that are fully deployable even now without the tax incentives. Maybe we need to revisit those tax incentives to better understand if they should be utilized not now for a new industry, but to tackle the climate problem. We can send a price signal. It doesn't have to be increasing costs. It can be focused on reducing costs for sequestration, like carbon capture, utilization, and storage, 
um, as James mentioned, or for carbon emissions avoidance, which is really what you're talking about when you're looking at renewable technologies. States, on the other hand, are the only places where you've seen the types of policies that um, that David has been talking about in terms of increasing costs. States have capped and traded carbon dioxide emissions. States have been able to put in clean energy standards that um, guide at the state level the types of policies um, and regulations that, that need to be enacted to tackle the climate problem. And I think that that's a good thing. Um, state regulators, state elected officials are much easier to hold to account than uh, folks at the federal level. Um, and I think that there's, there's less likely to be some of the problematic uh, regulatory design and, and really slow regulatory design that you do see at the federal level. And I, I would also say that uh, states are, you know, nothing to sneeze at. So I'm, I'm very interested in Canada's climate policy, very interested in Alberta's climate policy, uh, you know, and California is bigger than the entirety of Canada. So I think that, you know, that, and for better or for worse, sometimes we see things about how, uh, you know, some of these policies work out by working with the states. I do think there's like, there are some uh, coordination problems that occur that in some ways FERC has a role in managing. And, you know, I, I do think that if we see a lot of climate action, I don't believe that the majority of it's gonna happen under the Clean Air Act going forward. I think, you know, to the extent you see climate action, it may be, um, it may be with majorities that are interested in pushing it through different methods. But uh, um, there still are important regulations, obviously, under the Clean Air Act. Well, Nate, I think maybe it's time for me to turn things over to you to um, to look at the audience questions and maybe share some of those with our panelists. There's a lot going on in the chat. I have one yeah. eye in the chat and a lot going on there, too. I, I, I'm doing my best to track them. I, th there's a bunch of questions um, that kind of uh, are around a similar theme. I think they want uh, some discussions from the some discussion from the panelists about the technologies that uh, are being advanced that everyone's most excited about. I think they want to hear more about innovations um, in, in this space and also maybe resources so they can learn more about, you know, where would you direct people if they want to learn more about such technologies. David, I think you're on mute. You're on now. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I'll just say that what we need is a portfolio. And it's a portfolio of investment in uh, uh, in new tech. The federal government has a um, uh, a key role in that. I mean, it's going back to, you know, the uh, promotion of the railroad, but um, the federal government has uh, uh, been instrumental in reducing the costs of many of the clean energy technologies through the research and development that was done through the energy department. Uh, and, it, and while some people like to pick on a, a couple of losers, overall their portfolio is damn good and has very good returns. Um, the tax credits which are even more neutral in the sense that, um, uh, you know, they, they, they're, well, they're just more technology neutral are also very important in bringing down um, clean energy costs. Uh, but deployment is uh, going to be a problem, uh, um, uh, except where you're really able to get the costs below um, current incumbent technologies. If the incumbent technologies are dirty, but they're cheaper, they're gonna stick around. They're gonna stick around forever until we have some sort of limits uh, on uh, the pollution. Um, but we do need a portfolio of investment in clean technologies and deployment through um, getting the market signals right. Um, to talk about some of the technologies that I'm most excited about. I think the carbon capture utilization and storage space uh, is, is really fascinating uh, to me. And so this is taking carbon dioxide and uh, here in Maryland, there's a coal fire power plant where they, they take the carbon dioxide and then they utilize it, purify it, 
uh, and it comes out and they can use it for fizzy drinks to carbonate beer and soda and, and whatnot. And, and that seems uh, good and fine. Um, sequestering it under underground in large quantities is the next step and scalable uh, and something that has been demonstrated in Texas and in Illinois. And it's right around the corner. We just need to actually have those uh, market signals come across better um, and in a longer term way. And, and, and that's been one step in the right direction um, through the 45Q tax credit. So I think that whole space where we can look at how to reduce emissions in heavy industry and in some of the existing uh, oil and gas uh, and fossil fuel fleet that we have um, is vital. Not because we're ever going to build a new coal-fired power plant in the United States. We won't. But they're still building coal-fired power plants in Africa, in Asia, and in Latin America. And if we can have U.S. technologies where we've refined carbon capture storage and we can retrofit and help sell those technologies around the world, then we can help solve what is truly a global problem. When it comes to here in the United States, some of the things that I'm most excited about and maybe that I lose the most sleep about are how to keep and maintain nuclear power uh, online. David mentioned, you know, the great scandals that have unfolded protecting some legacy assets and it's a problem. I'm, I'm not going to, uh, you know, hide that at all because some of these plants aren't nearly as economical as they used to be, but we still need to be able to value their environmental contribution. Nuclear power provides something like 30% of the electric power um, to the United States. That 30% is a pretty big slice of the pizza, but it provides 60% of the zero emissions power that we have available today, 60%. That's not something that we can walk away from. And a lot of these nuclear assets are reaching the end of their useful life or will do so in the next 20 years. The small modular reactors that need to fill in and bridge the gap behind them are uh, still very early um, in, their, in their infancy. And that's something that we need to see piloted and fast tracked with support of the federal government from a very clean uh, permit standpoint and siting standpoint. So there's more that the government can do it, it has to do with regulatory modernization rather than making uh, new regulations. And then one of the commenters that I did see, you know, talked about hydropower and the question is like, aren't, aren't hydropower projects really terrible for waterways? Yeah, in a lot of cases they have been. And that's why I think looking at existing dams and infrastructure, and I mentioned 88,000 dams in the United States, a lot of those are on the, on the cusp of falling apart. Some of them were built 80 years ago, 100 years ago. They need to be retrofit or they need to be taken down. If it would restore a waterway, let's take it down. And we can have the Army Corps of Engineers help and, and do that uh, work. If there's a way to establish a public-private partnership so that the work can be undertaken to retrofit that dam and generate electricity, the money comes from the private sector. The benefit is that a public asset, that dam, gets revitalized and rehabilitated creates local jobs and creates clean energy in a local way, that's a big win. And I think that that's what I'm really interested in seeing is how we can lower costs and create locally appropriate clean energy solutions all around the United States and then be able to deploy those solutions around the world. Yeah, so I would say um, in terms of things that have been very you know, impressive, if we look at the last decade, Certainly, the expansion in solar, wind, and natural gas power that we had that allowed us to match, you know, clean up our power system dramatically, that has been, you know, something that we weren't necessarily looking for. I think the other big surprise that's helped us clean up both our air and our climate has been the uh, rise of electric vehicles. I think people thought it was going to be a bigger challenge to make a profitable electric car that people wanted to buy. Uh, and, you know, it's done. And as a result, you know, I mean, you have a company worth an insane amount of money. But um, but I think there are those challenges and that we don't necessarily expect and then they uh, and then we can get them. But I also, um, I would say that in terms of our biggest challenge, one of our biggest challenge is permitting around innovation. And if you look at, um, you know, if you look at, Green New Deal, the idea, let's get off of fossil fuel and go to all zero carbon, you know, renewable sources in 10 years. Well, if you look at the current time to permit a power line, like if you didn't want, if I just wanted a little more wind power on the system, it's over 10 years. 
So how are you supposed to entirely change the system if it takes over 10 years to permit a single power line? And as I said, I think NEPA is part of the issue there, the National Environmental Policy Act, but there are other issues as well. You know, if you look at, you know, in 1935, San Francisco decided to build Treasure Island and it was finished in 1937, okay? In 2001, they decided they wanted a new bus lane on Van Ness. A couple of years ago, they said, you know, maybe we'll get to it by 2022. So there is in all public planning processes and regulatory process, there has been an extreme, uh, there has been extreme lengthening of timelines. And, you know, particularly for somebody who's interested in integrating more renewable power into the grid. Texas has more wind power than anywhere. Why is that? That's because we figured out a permitting process to get the power from, uh, you know, to ease permitting for the power lines. And that's a, that's a huge challenge with respect to all of our clean energy sources, whether it's renewable or natural gas, et cetera. It is um, getting permitting done is very difficult, whether you're looking to provide a new product or do new infrastructure. And so I think there is an opportunity to accomplish big things if we can solve some of that permitting, those permitting issues. I, I did think, um, getting back to the film again, that the project, those artificial trees, if he, if, the, if the incentives are right so that he can build them, he's going to run into permitting problems. So we'll run into the other problem that we have. But I'd just like to agree with you, James, that I think we can't predict today what the solutions are going to be. And trying to do that, trying to predict what technologies and give them a nudge, I think is dangerous because it gets in the way of maybe an innovation that we hadn't thought of. Nate, do we have time for another audience question or should we yeah. wrap up? Well, I think we've done a pretty good job, actually, of answering a bunch of the questions in the chat. So I guess I would just give maybe 30 seconds to each of our panelists to maybe conclude. Uh, if you have a final thought to leave with our audience, um, that would be great. And David, if you'd like to go first, we'd, we'd love to have your reflection. Well, thanks. Uh I am actually encouraged by the uh, fact that the, everybody on this uh, panel seems to agree that the climate change problem is real and serious. And while we may have differences about how to deal with it, this is not the, the kind of dialogue I had at the Federalist Society, uh, Federalist Society meetings, you know, a few years ago. Um, and so if we can all agree that we have a huge problem on our hands, then it should be easier to see our way to some solutions. And I look forward to, uh, to working with anybody to achieve that. So thanks for including me. Sure, and, and maybe I'll just uh, build off of what David said. Um, I think there is consensus and we have reached this tipping point that um, federal there will be federal action there will be additional state action and i think that we can welcome that it's not just up to the states it's not shouldn't just up uh, be up to the federal government either it should be up to corporations it should be up to individuals to be able to take action and do something of their own accord to be able to drive home this net zero future that we need to get to from a policy standpoint at the federal level i would love it to be as limited as possible and focused on reducing costs and increasing options and if we can do that, we will be able to assure that all of the options are on the table for uh, local governments, for businesses, for individuals to be able to cite what's locally appropriate. And if it's at the lowest possible cost, we'll be able to deploy it quickly, get more bang for the buck, more emissions reductions in the near term and in the long term, and be able to expect, export those solutions to the least developed countries in the world and really tackle this problem uh, on the time horizon that we have uh, left ahead of us. And, and I think that it can be done and I am encouraged by this conversation. So thanks for the opportunity to participate. Thank you so much to all of you. I, I really am very encouraged as well. And uh, I would just say that, you know, if you are looking for more information on some of these things, I do with the uh, academics of the University of Texas, Colorado, South Carolina, we have a energytradeoffs.com website where we look at, uh, we do a bunch of podcasts on that, or I've got all it on my website at energylawprof.com. But I would also encourage, please everybody watch this watch this movie. It's, it's pretty cool. The technology is, is really amazing. And 
you know, I'm I'm optimistic about humanity's ability to solve this using uh, innovation. It's one of our best qualities. Got some got some bad ones. That's a good one. Well, Nate, I'll just say thank you for hosting this. And and yes, if you haven't watched the movie, do. Nate, you told me earlier today that it actually won an award. I guess you are, you did say that to the group. So it's um, an award-winning movie. So That's right. Best documentary at the Anthem Film Festival. So we're very excited about that. I think it was also time for the audience's pick for uh, the best documentary. So uh, great stuff. Um, and great stuff again uh, with this conversation. Grateful to all of you for joining us. Uh, certainly to Administrator Wheeler and Susan and David, Charles and James, we really appreciate it. Uh, we welcome your feedback on tonight's program by email at rtp at red, regproject.org. Um, in the chat box, you'll see a link to next Thursday's program. Uh, that will be on the future of our food. That's October 1st at 7 p.m. That fee uh, panel will feature the Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue. Uh, we will have John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods, join us. We'll also have Josh Tet Tetrick, the CEO of Eat Just, who was featured in the film, and Anastasia Bowden, who, uh, who will uh, moderate it from the Pacific Legal Foundation. With that, it's been a wonderful, uh, wonderful panel. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, Nate.